relapsing brain disease, dependence, and tolerance, loss of control. Hi, welcome to Community Conversations. I am Melissa and I'm here with Alicia. We're here to discuss addiction and the passion that we both have for working in addiction in the field, learning more about um, why people use drugs and what we can do to help prevent that. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about addiction, of course, we mean someone who has lost control over their use, they're using despite negative consequences, serious negative consequences. They may show tolerance um, and withdrawal symptoms if they stop using, um, negative impact on their life. Tell me a little bit about how you got into this field and you know where this passion comes from. So I got into this field about 10 years ago after losing a loved one uh, to the disease of addiction. Story pretty much what we're seeing now, being prescribed pain pills, teenage years, sports injury, which escalated into recreational drug use, continued prescriptions, and ultimately passed away from this disease. After that, this was in 2006, so it was kind of the, the onset and the height of um, the prescription, well, opiate epidemic, what we were seeing it with certain drugs at that time was starting to come to light. And in researching it, I was finding that the numbers were just increasing. The deaths were increasing astronomically. People were dying at uh, record numbers from all opiates, Oxycontin, Percocet, Vicodin, and uh, Methadone primarily at that time. So I started uh, researching it got into this field primarily as an advocate mm -hmm. and as an activist and did a lot of advocacy work with the federal government and working closely with SAMHSA, uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, as well as CSAT, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, and I was on a few different advisory groups and met a whole bunch of families who were in the same situation and the stories were all very different but the same. It was happening so frequently I had met mothers who lost their young children, 14, 15, 16 years old. Kids were starting to move from recreational use of alcohol and marijuana to recreational use of pain pills. Mm -hmm. It's when they were doing a lot of the um, uh, farm parties. So I got started advocating with, uh, for doctors to start being responsible with prescribing meds. Worked with various organizations. Methadone was pretty much at the height uh, at the time. It was as the, the single opiate the drug that was found in more overdose deaths mm. at that time. Well, we worked closely um, with the government and everybody else and, and helped um, eliminate the 40 milligram tablet as well as uh, some new indications for prescribing in pain management and uh, methadone clinics. Mm -hmm. Clearly it continued and at that um, at that time, we were also advocating for expansion of Narcan, Narcan prescriptions with every pain prescription, as well as giving out Narcan to lay people and um, at the methadone clinics during induction and for uh, clients on maintenance. It was unheard of. I can't tell you how many times I got laughed at <laughs> for that suggestion and just so thrilled to see that come to fruition today. Yeah, so and I was going to say, tell, tell me more yeah. about the Narcan and why that's so important. Why it's so important to... Uh, Helping prevent overdose deaths is because it can reverse a death. Yeah. Working with families who lost loved ones to the overdose, I can't tell you how many times I've heard parents say, I heard a loud gurgling, snoring sound coming from my child, and I got up and closed their door, and in the morning found them dead, mm -hmm. um, where a Narcan prescription in the house could have saved them. I've spoke to countless people who had family members prescribe pain medications for legitimate reasons, they overdosed and died. Either the they weren't titrated properly on it, they were opiate naive, or they were prescribed uh, mixing the medications and where Narcan could have saved their life. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's so important to get it out there to as many people that we possibly can. Yeah. Because another thing you hear about is a lot of people um, being dropped on front lawns or mm -hmm. just being left to die because they're afraid to call the police. Mm -hmm. When uh, discussing the Narcan, for specifically for the client population is to discuss the um, Good Samaritan laws with them. Yeah. Good Samaritan law uh, passed in 2011 says that if you call 911 when somebody is overdosing and you um, are in possession 
of drugs or paraphernalia that you will not be charged. There are limits to that law, of course, if, if you know, you're, there's other crimes in progress or they were already in the process of serving a search warrant or seizure warrant, but primarily it's aimed at saving people's lives. So a lot of people are afraid that if they're in possession of uh, paraphernalia or drugs that they won't call 911 out of fear of being arrested. Mm -hmm. But um, the Good Samaritan law says that if you're doing this to save somebody's life, then you won't be charged. Yeah, and it's uh, another thing I think people don't realize is that the Narcan doesn't have negative effects for someone who isn't addicted or if there aren't opiates in their system, mm -hmm. it doesn't cause any harm. So it's something that's, I think, really critical, obviously. Exactly, and that's a question I get asked all the time when I do the training. Um, you know, so if somebody is just using alcohol, you know, should I still give them Narcan? And the thing is, if you don't know for sure that's the only thing they've used, yeah, I would say go ahead and do it because it can't hurt them. Yeah, um, it's the same thing with you don't know all the drugs that somebody took, and you know the importance as well as uh, still contacting nine one one. Yeah, because they could have a longer acting opioid on board, and you know they could re overdose. Right. Wow. After the Narcan mm -hmm. wears off, that's how I got involved in this. How How did you find your passion? So. Um, I'm a researcher. I primarily study how alcohol and drugs impact the brain and what is going on in the brain that makes some people vulnerable. And I started this work in college. As a kid from the 80s, we heard the um, This Is Your Brain on Drugs campaign. Okay, last time. And, um, as a skeptical drugs. teenager, you know, I didn't know what to believe, and this I really wanted to get to the bottom of, of it and find out what the science told us. So I started doing this research to try to really understand um, from a scientific point of view, what's the evidence? Started working uh, with adolescents and college students who we know are uh, escalating their use during mm -hmm. that time and wanted to understand how that escalating use might be impacting the brain, which is still developing during that time. When I started doing this work, it was not that well known that the brain is continuing to develop mm -hmm. all the way into your 20s. We know that pretty well at this point, um, but it was kind of new information at the time and we really didn't know how uh, alcohol and other drugs might be impacting that process. So I started working in a research lab to get this information and try to understand the science behind all of this. And then I became passionate about uh, trying to get this information out to the public. So I think it's something, there's this disconnect between the scientific community and the general community and I um, became an advocate of sorts as well trying to um, disseminate this knowledge and, and talk to teenagers and talk to college students about the impact of alcohol and drugs on the brain, on their emotions, um, on their social relationships, all of these things are impacted by the drug use and if we can understand what's happening in the brain um, that may um, impact people's behavior. I sort of take every opportunity I, I can to talk to teens and college students about this. I taught college for many years and I always throw in, you know, the extra information about addiction and I do a big segment on mental illness in general, but I always talk about addiction. I educate them because I think a lot of this is just stuff that they don't know. They don't know what addiction is. They don't know a lot about how different substances may affect them. They don't know information about who around them is using. I think they have a lot of misconceptions. Mm -hmm. um, especially with college drinking. They think everyone around them is drinking. Mm -hmm. You ask them how many college students are uh, have had a drink in the past month and they say 90% and that's that's not true. It's more like 50, 60 percent if we look at national surveys. So they're overestimating what's going on around them and that kind of gets into what we were talking about in terms of normalizing. Mm -hmm. If you think 90 percent of people are doing it then it's normal, it's accepted, it's okay for you to do. And so we try to get that information out there and say, well, no, it's really not 90%, it's probably more like 50%. So if you're not drinking, you know, you, you may be in the majority of people. Um, so I talk to them about that. I go into the high school classrooms and try to talk to them and teach them about how it impacts the brain. We see effects in people who aren't really using a whole lot as teenagers. We see it in, um, in teens not only who we would consider dependent on alcohol or mm -hmm. addicted mm -hmm. but also in teens who are sort of these normal binge drinkers these teens who are going to parties on the weekends you know maybe drinking two or three times a month not every day um, drinking four drinks on an occasion for a girl five drinks on an occasion for a guy so it's not huge amounts of alcohol mm -hmm. and yet we're seeing an impact on the brain we're seeing that their memories aren't as good they uh, take more effort to learn information. 
their brains are working harder to try to get that information in and they're not retaining as much of the information. And again, these are sort of your normal teens, pretty high functioning, um, they're not in treatment or anything. When we first saw the data, we were a bit surprised because it seemed like a bigger effect than we might expect from these teens who haven't really been drinking all that long and not that great of levels. So I just try to get that information out to people and talk to them about the effects that we are seeing. That's fascinating. Thanks. It really is. What, um, what response do the kids have to you in the classroom? I mean, so far, pretty positive. I think um, they love the information. Mm -hmm. I think um, they want to hear it. They want to know how it's impacting them. Um, and I tell them, you know, use this information to make informed decisions. I'm giving you the data. I'm not trying to preach mm -hmm. at you or lecture you. I'm just telling you what the data have shown us so far. We are seeing these effects, especially with memory and inhibition, so inhibiting impulses. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the main areas. So frontal lobe, which is still developing into um, into your mid-20s mm -hmm. and is critical for making good decisions and critical for inhibiting impulses. Those are skills that we clearly need and those are skills that are impacted by alcohol and drug use. So the brain is still developing and yet you're introducing these substances that are impacting those areas of the brain and potentially making it difficult to continue making good decisions. So perhaps, you know, it's this vicious cycle. Someone makes a choice to um, use alcohol or drugs at a time when their brain isn't as good at making choices and making good decisions because that skill is still developing, then the alcohol and drugs come in and impair that ability further and it becomes this vicious cycle of continued use. Have you gotten positive feedback from them in the way that they've said that some of this data, some of this information has actually made them think twice about using or drinking? I think, or I think so. It? I think so. We've seen reduced use mm -hmm. in Wallingford. All of the activities that we've done in the classroom here have reduced use. The <laughs> survey results just came out recently and we've seen a reduction in their use since uh, two years ago. So that tells us that some of these programs are, are having an impact in our community. So that's really exciting. That's wonderful. The parents, do they get the, some of this information as well? Are we disseminating this to them? Because I think a lot of parents still are under the assumption, you know, if they're drinking at home, it's okay, or it's just normal teen stuff, or right. once in a while, or boys will be boys. Right. Are they right. getting this information that this is not just normal kid stuff, this actually can have long-term effects to their brain, mm -hmm. let alone the risk um, to develop an addictive disorder? Absolutely. I think that's so critical, and that's something that I think is going to be an important future direction that we haven't really addressed as much yet, but I think it, it is going to be important to talk to parents and exactly mm -hmm. what you said, that this could have a negative impact in the long term. Another one is, is marijuana. There's a lot of talk about marijuana now. Marijuana is a plant. Mm -hmm. Marijuana is not mm -hmm. harmful. It's a medicine. It's, we're considering it for legalization. But the data that we have suggests that there are uh, long-term impacts on the brain um, for teens and college students as well. So especially memory and some of these uh, decision-making and inhibition types of of thinking skills that are impacted by marijuana use. The brain is still developing and even though it's a plant and it's um, uh, people consider it harmless, there mm -hmm. are definitely some negative impacts that we see. Well, like I've said in, in my practice, again, I have clients who have been prescribed it, but again, they're adults and mm -hmm. they're using it for a um, medicinal purpose. But yes, the, the on the developing brain, there are, it has been linked to different mental health disorders as yes. well. Yes, absolutely. Been linked to um, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So some of these problems may be exacerbated by mm -hmm. marijuana use, or they may be in part caused by it. And especially if somebody has a family history yes. of that, and maybe it hasn't come out yet, and they start using these drugs at a young age, they might mm -hmm. be more likely to develop absolutely that uh, mental disorder. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's it's concerning, to say the least. So I think you know. As a whole, the, the kids, the families, this information does need to get out there because a lot of people don't know this and they mm -hmm. do just see what's going on in the yep. media. What do you think is one of the main things that we need to know in order to help prevent or stop a young person from using or intervening when they do start to use? Um, I think prevention uh, programs at an early age are going to be really critical. Um, 
because we know that the younger someone starts using, the more likely they're going to end up having problems and having bigger problems in the future. Um, I think um, there's a lot of importance in um, mental health issues and, and discussing um, better prevention and uh, addressing different emotional difficulties. Um, I think a lot of times people may end up using because they're trying to cope with negative emotions. We know that there's a lot of overlap between substance use and mental health issues. Mm -hmm. People may be using to, um, to deal with some of those emotions, but in the long run, obviously, this isn't a good strategy, and the alcohol and drug use can exacerbate some of those existing problems with anxiety or depression, and I'm sure you see a lot mm -hmm. of this in your clinical practice as well. Absolutely. I work with adults primarily, as, but um, in speaking with them, it starts very young, 9, 10, 12. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, when I talk to some of my clients, I hear, when you hear 15, 16, 17, that's almost the older end of it, yep. but it starts even before they first pick up a drug or alcohol, either um, with trauma, mm -hmm. mental health issues, family history of substance abuse, and then the consequences to the child that go along with that. Um, but I think, I think partly, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I think the stigma, um, adds to this. Absolutely. The fact that people are afraid to discuss this with their kids, afraid to have these conversations, mm -hmm. I think definitely adds to children continuing to use or the inability to help them cope with what's going on, the peer pressure that's mm -hmm. happening because a lot of people just don't want to believe that it could be their child and you know that doesn't help the situation and sometimes I think and my daughter could probably tell you I'm always thinking it could be my child and not that I think less of my child but I just want to be aware of what's happening mm -hmm. um, in their lives and and just understanding the reality of what they're dealing with in the social pressure that they're yes. dealing with in school and, and with their peer group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned family history as well, mm -hmm. which is such a big risk factor. Um, and I think, you know, um, knowing one's own family history, knowing one's own kind of uh, difficulties to help kind of make these informed decisions. In my practice with family members, we have a lot of fathers, mothers, children, siblings. So it, it clearly is a family issue. Mm -hmm. And even if um, not everybody in the family is identified as an addict or somebody with this disease, you usually see that there is something else in the family, whether it's um, binge drinking, risky drinking, and then it still passes down. And, and you probably have more information about that too. It's not always the same drug of choice. Right. It definitely leads them at a higher risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can we get that out? How do we get that out there to the families? How do we help family members, uh, parents, to recognize that maybe um, some of their risky behaviors uh, might be influencing or impacting the kids, that maybe it's not just parties on the weekends where maybe there's over-drinking or risky drinking, mm -hmm. that it seems fun the children see this and they want to model that behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And I th the social en environment is such a, a critical issue and in, in informing these attitudes and sort of normalizing the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, people often make the argument or believe the myth that in Europe the drinking rates are lower because the drinking age is so much lower and so people learn to drink responsibly and they see it in the family and it's just part of you know wine with dinner and those types of things but it's actually not the case they have much higher rates of binge drinking there astronomically higher than in the United States because it is sort of normalized and they see it in their social environment and it's almost expected to have this behavior so I think just getting that information to people and trying to educate well, not only the students but the families as well. So how do we do that? I think that's probably one of the most important questions because a lot of people, like I said before, don't want to believe that that could be happening in their family. Yeah. They don't see it as an issue, it's everybody else's. Or they just don't want to talk about it, they have shame and they're in denial. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is the way that that is normalized, we need to normalize the conversation. 
Yes. Yeah. And put it out there to everybody. When your child is struggling with the disease of addiction, I don't think it should be something to be ashamed of. It should be like any other disease. You know, it's... If somebody's having surgery, people bring food over your house. <laughs> You know, and they're there to support you, and your community is there to support you. Your close network of friends are there to support you. But if your child's going off to rehab, nobody wants to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And it's something to be sh uh, ashamed of. And this is some of the things that need to change in order for us to look at this, truly look at this as a disease. Absolutely. Just looking recently at the obituaries in, in this area, too, I've seen families who have posted um, obituaries saying that their uh, loved one lost their battle to addiction and I think that's it's it's sad it's heartbreaking each and every time I read one but in a way it gets it it gets the story out there and um, if that can save one life or one person mm -hmm. from looking in the other direction mm -hmm. I think that that matters absolutely um, kind of like you were asking about how the students receive it and mm -hmm. have we you know overall we've seen statistically that the rates are going down but I've you know talked to individual students as well who've said you know this made an impact on me and it, again if you can make an impact on one person and get them to think twice about their behavior then that's that's significant one of my um, closest dearest friends um, who is a very strong advocate and um, she found her son uh, dead of an overdose several years ago, and she went on to create an organization in her state. It's called How to Save a Life Foundation. So they get people into treatment who otherwise wouldn't have an opportunity to get into treatment. She was working on getting laws passed mm -hmm. in his name. Kind of some of the things that we're doing in this state, making access to treatment easier mm -hmm. and getting um, assessments much quicker and not having people wait and she's actually funded beds for people and helped them through the recovery process and has been responsible for saving the lives of many people. Without some of these groups and some of these parents, I don't know if this would be in the um, national spotlight as much as it is now because it, it's affecting everybody. And I think one of the most important things that is being verbalized now, the face of addiction has changed. Mm. It's not who it used to be. It's anybody, yeah. any race, gender, religion, social class, ethnicity. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how poor you are or what neighborhood you live in. It's touching everybody. Yep. People are paying more attention now. It's just a matter of getting everybody to talk about it more and mm -hmm. still not have that shame and stigma Absolutely. attached. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's a stigma to mental illness in general, mm -hmm. and this is just, I think the stigma is even stronger. I agree, because, you know, people talk about depression and anxiety like it's not a big deal. Oh, I'm on Prozac. What are you on? It's almost conversational now. But when you bring addiction into it, and, and then even within addiction, mm -hmm. it's nicer to say that somebody has a prescription drug problem than it is to say that, that they're addicted to heroin. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's the same thing with cocaine has a better connotation than crack. Mm -hmm one leads to the other yeah absolutely and ultimately I think people still have this stigma that it's you know a character flaw or you know they they made bad decisions mm -hmm. and a weakness yes a exactly. moral failing yes your work is so important that it shows that it it, it is a brain disease mm -hmm. and this is something that we try to convey but a lot of people still don't believe it mm -hmm. they just don't believe that this is a disease and it's not like cancer or heart disease or diabetes but it is mm -hmm. it is in many ways and maybe if we start to see it in that way then we won't look down on that person that mm -hmm. that has this disease absolutely and it, you know i think alcohol is a really interesting example because so much of the population does drink but only a proportion of those people become addicted mm -hmm. so it's sort of this socially acceptable behavior it's very common but what's different about those people? And I don't think they're, you know, they have character flaws because they became addicted when, mm -hmm. you know, two-thirds of the people who drink don't become addicted. Thank you for coming here and having this uh, conversation with me. Um, hopefully we can make a positive impact on the community. With
the Warm Langford. It's a nice community. I really enjoy it. I, I love living here and I love everything about it, but at the same time, I've seen a lot of people not wanting to talk about things or the nimbyism, not in my backyard kind of, and that scares me. And I know the Coalition is doing a wonderful job of bringing this to the forefront, but it, it is scary. It's really scary.